this uh, talk is uh, has like two reasons. One is in relation to the exhibition and Calkins work, uh, which is part of uh, the group show that we put up together. And that it takes some time to see a lot of the material, so please feel free to come back and delve more deeply into the narratives that each of the works of art or documents uh, bring uh, in conversation. And uh, the other part is that this talk is uh, a public talk in relation in the context of Escuela, that uh, just briefly for those who uh, are not familiar, but I think many of you are, <laughs> for the sake of the camera, is that uh, Escuela is our public program where there's five topics that we uh, structured uh, around uh, one called Perfidy Viviana, the other one called uh, Context Responsive Art, in which uh, this presentation is linked to, and the other uh, topic is uh, Choreography and Dance, where we'll have Insa uh, telling uh, presenting us an idea in the future. <laughs> and, um, and the other one is related to histories and narratives of war and post-war, specifically bringing artists that in their practice uh, they have uh, made works specifically related to Vietnam War or Second World War, which are two main war contexts that uh, the Philippines has a connection, but has been mostly seen through a national lens or a national history. But this artist will bring other contexts of that same uh, period or that same event. Anyway, because we're starting late-ish, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to give the microphone to Koken. I want to introduce you, as we've introduced you many times, and it's all of that, but we're very happy that you're here. Uh, so, just briefly, that the company is coming from Istanbul and has been here now for some weeks with us. And uh, this talk will give us more context of what we are seeing in the exhibition and other parts of the threat. Uh, I don't think the microphone will reach there, so I'm going to ask everybody to follow me into the exhibition space because we start the talk from there. If you want to bring the camera as well, it could be in a few minutes. <laughs> I'm not going to take my mic. I can speak loud. Okay, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, a lot of people have been asking me, even today, somebody asked me, how did you find about this beauty pageant? So, I just want to start with the story of how it happened. One day I was walking on the streets in Tel Aviv and I saw this. This is a poster that I saw of, I think on the edge of the bus station, which I'll tell you inside why this bus station is important. Uh, I was invited for a residency in uh, Israel and like many artists they were expecting me to make a work about the uh, Israeli problem. I prefer to call it the Israeli problem because the state of Israel is newer than the Palestinian settlements. It's more recent. Uh, so I, I didn't want to go that way, I was thinking what to do, this was 8 years ago, I was much younger, so I was in the beginning of my career. 10 years ago? Actually 10 years ago I started doing it, I, it took me 2 years to make it, or 3 years. Uh, yeah, 10 years ago I was there, and uh, I saw this. And I immediately like, took it off from the wall. I put it on the wall of my bed, like flat in a bit. And here you see a phone number. It's very open, like you can <laughs> just call. This was all over a certain neighborhood in Tel Aviv, but there are two phone numbers. And this, this really struck my attention. How public can this be? And I've never heard about Filipino beauty pageants before. I have seen a couple of beauty pageants, but I've never known why, how important it is for <coughs> Filipino culture. <coughs> and then I called the number, I called the first number, Charlene James Dunn, but I was already 
thinking like why two names and why one, one name is female, one male. <laughs> and so I picked this one. And this is the organizer. So I called her out of respect I prefer to call James Her. Um, so I just said, I introduced myself, I said I'm a young artist and uh, I'm interested in what you're doing, can I come and see? And immediately from the first minute she called me the journalist. The word artist didn't correspond to her, just, I was a journalist. I kept repeating, no I'm not a journalist, I'm an artist, I'm hoping maybe I can do something. I'm interested in doing this. And at that point, I didn't know that now people, now people who work in arts call me uh, the ethnographer artist. At that time, I didn't really study ethnography myself. I studied theater acting, which I never did. Uh, and I knew about anthropology a little bit, but I didn't know the motif behind this uh, wasn't intentional. I just liked this phone number, and I called that phone number. And I went to this nightclub, which is inside the bus station. Of course, this is the actual event. You will see inside, when we go inside, I'll show you the, the building. Uh, so it was a, like a series of consequences. Like, I didn't know how important this building was in the life of Israeli society. I didn't know why it was so important in the Second Intifada. And I didn't know the diasporic Filipino community. I was a diasporic individual because I come from Istanbul, but I was living in Berlin at the time, and uh, I was in the diaspora, I was living abroad. Uh, so that's why I put at the end of the film, maybe you missed it, it's dedicated to all of those people who live abroad. Uh, so I'm skipping forward, I videotaped this event, a couple of a couple of uh, beauty pageants together as well, and then I started, this is James, who has the phone number, mm -hmm. and you're going to see her in the film a lot, she's the organizer. And uh, so I made the film, and then it wasn't enough for me to make the film. I went back to Israel many times. My family was worried. They said, "Why are you going to Israel so much? Like, because it's not like a good reputation <laughs> in our part of the world." They were worried that I was going to live there, and, uh, and they knew my ex-partner, ex-boyfriend, was Israeli. But at that point, I wasn't with him. Uh, but still, again. There was so much Israel in my life, but I didn't really deal with the Israelis. I dealt with the most unexpected Filipino uh, community, and that's why even today this guy here who asked me, he just didn't understand. No, I was from Turkey, but I made a film in Israel about Filipino beauty pageants, and this work is also showing now in Germany, and the press is talking about it. Why this Turkish artist is doing? Because they usually expect Turkish artists to make a work about Turkey, right? They expect Filipino artists to make a work about Filipino Philippines. They expect Brazilian artists not to make a work about Mosul. You have to, <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> not a Brazilian artist. So there is this thing, and I think one of the most important things of this work is that nobody can place it anywhere. Um, so I started seeing them more and more. I attended their rehearsals. Uh, after finishing the film, I went back to Israel again. I made a lot of interviews, and we became very good friends. And then that was the start of Facebook, like my beginning of Facebook. Some of my friends were already on Facebook. They were really staunch users of Facebook at the time already. And then we got along very well online and offline. And then I started collecting. You can stand up and look at this magazine. Uh, closely examined some of them. When you get closer, you'll see here you see a beauty pageant, the celebration of beauty and Filipino culture, but here you see the real issues of the Filipino community in Israel. So I started collecting these magazines, and uh, for example, one of the main issues is the deportation and the visa issue. Uh, if a Filipino overseas worker, female, Filipina, uh, gives birth to a baby in Israel, she, uh, the, the baby does not have the right to live in Israel because he is not Jewish or she is not Jewish. Uh, the, the mother has to be Jewish. That's the lineage in the Jewish-Israeli state. So one issue is deportation, immigration, and in the film you see, if you watch it, 
the most important, uh, like the biggest uh, applause comes to the, uh, the girl who says, we wish our visa to be extended. Four years and three months is not enough to save money for my future and more for my family. Uh, so they try to stay as long as possible and one of the reasons overseas uh, OFWs prefer to be in Israel is because of Jesus. Because Bethlehem is inside the occupied territories, which means it's inside Israel. Bethlehem is ruled by Israeli state and uh, OFWs tend to support Israeli state very radically as much as they are supporting Duterte very radically. In a recent survey, in the last elections, not in this one, in two months, uh, two weeks ago, uh, the, absent, uh, the overseas voters uh, have voted around 95% for Duterte. So they are also for security, they want the world to be very secure, so uh, they, they completely refuse the Palestinian uh, issue. And when I was teaching in Ramallah at the time, half of the week I was in Ramallah, my OFW friends were really worried. They, they thought I was going to die. Every week I was going there. I said, oh, well, this is a very uh, bad people. They're terrorists. And we don't want you to go. We really like you so much. You shouldn't let us. Uh, you, should, you should come back. You should call us. Uh, so it was very interesting uh, for me to see in the magazines. Like, maybe you can stand up and see. Uh, they are very proud of Filipino male overseas workers staying in Israel longer And also, they are uh, here. In Golan Heights, which Trump recently said it belongs to Israel, which is a huge diplomatic crisis, because it's this buffer zone between Lebanon and Israel, and nobody claims it as strongly as Trump for Israel. So, uh, the overseas Filipino worker community is very proud of uh, the Philippine uh, army personnel fighting or is like for the peacekeeping, but we know that the, this peacekeeping is more favoring the Israeli side. Mm -hmm. uh, another issue is uh, beauty pageants, because I'll explain inside why beauty pageants are the glue to their society. They bond the people together. Mm -hmm. They say that if we are not allowed to make our beauty pageants, we cannot go on living because we have to perform these rituals of home so that we, we don't go crazy because seven six days of the week they're inside a house, sometimes really harsh conditions. Uh, maybe we will see this woman has been abused uh, at, at home. Uh, there was a murder case, again, uh, by an employer. And uh, there's another case, and there's another case. Uh, this man has been uh, seen um, abusing Filipinas uh, in the area around the bus station. So these magazines are very useful for the community. They're not sold to the Israelis, they're usually for the community. They're spread out freely, but they bring their issues forward. For example, OFW abuse in the hands of the immigration police. Most, uh, the, the general public in Israel considers any Filipino woman as an easy woman, as they say. Like, this is considered any Filipino woman is free for sexual gain. And this is unfortunately unstoppable, like, you, you can't change their mind. And uh, tragically also, when I show this work, this is one of my most shown works, when I show this work to a very intellectual elite uh, art audience, you can't imagine how many professors, scholars and artists have asked me the question like, are they uh, sex workers? When they see Filipinas having a beauty pageant. Mm. So this is a common question that comes and that's why you see in these uh, covers a lot of, for example, like they're warning uh, their friends not to carry the bags like this in the area of the bus station. So this bus station um, is now occupied by Filipinos. And I'll tell you the reasons why inside. And when you come back to the exhibition, then you can spend more time in the interviews. Especially this one is people's favorite. I know a lot of people cry when they listen to this interview. <laughs> it's also my best friend of the OFWs. It's worth spending time with, with her. Uh, here, I'll show you. This is my Almodovar moment. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, on the left, you see her employer, and uh, I choose to go where she worked. So six days of the week, she's in this little tiny house, and the girl, the woman on the left, is a, a Holocaust survivor. I believe she's no longer alive, and Mary Lou is in the Philippines, back in the Philippines. So these people travel a lot; they are all over the world now. I think okay. just uh, in terms of the uh, type of work when you compare uh, OFWs from Hong Kong and Israel, mm -hmm. the majority, the grand majority of OFW in Israel are uh, caregivers, and as you said, most a lot of them are taking care of very, very elderly people that some of them were Holocaust survivors or were the ones that first occupied Israel in some cases? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. they were the yeah. kibbutznik. They were the, the, the founders of Israel. And uh, yes, and that's probably why they are very pro-Israeli yeah. in that sense, because their employer is pro-Israeli. It's very difficult for the, the domestic worker to oppose politically to the... I, I know a lot about this case because I'm currently writing a PhD about this topic as well. So <laughs> that's why I'm very like uh, researching Passionate. about... Yeah, I'm very informed <laughs> about st um, statistics of... Um, like uh, the situation at home, why they cannot politically contest their employers because they will lose their job, basically, if they don't support the view that they have. Uh, she is uh, one of the contestants in the film. Uh, you see her frequently in the film. And this woman is important because she is the oldest member. She was at that time the oldest member of the Filipina, so the Filipinas, and now she's also back in Israel. Uh, uh, sorry, back in the Philippines, and uh, in world uh, st uh, income, uh, I I globally, the income level of OFW, the, the salary uh, level of OFWs in Israel is somewhere in the middle. Hong Kong is the lowest. Uh, I think JIT, uh, no, Saudi Arabia is also not great. Uh, Istanbul is big salary. Uh, I'm hearing that it's a very good salary. Canada and uh, Italy are the what they call the green pastures. A lot of OFWs want to go to Canada because it's easier also to extend and I, I believe they can get a nationality as well like a passport. Italy in Europe is special because again of religion because Vatican is there. It's very very important. Uh, I'll tell you inside why People tend to be more religious and patriotic when they are told. Okay, I talked about the magazines. Now I can show you a little bit while we speak. Um, this is the, the inside of the Tahana Merkezit, which in Hebrew means like the central station. So this is where the pageant takes place, no? And this many is, things. This is where the pageant takes place. Oh, we have to do something. Sorry. It's... Uh, I don't know why I don't have any sound. Hello. I just changed this. Remember? In the 90s. Saddam Hussein? 1990. Yeah. 1990, yeah. So, uh, but Israel was formed much before. So the golden years of Israel, Israel and Lebanon happens to be falling in the 70s. When the, the kibbutz were very active and then uh, the, the, the farming techniques changed, the landscape. Uh, and the new... Uh, State of Israel wanted to build a very modernist bus station for their citizens. Before the new bus station, in, in the space of the old station, there used to be direct buses from Tel Aviv to Cairo, if you can believe it. We found uh, the post signs in Tel Aviv which showed Cairo. At that time it was 
completely free. There was no war. And then the war started. And then this building started to be being built. There was a lot of corruption. And it was built many, many years later. So when it was finally revealed, its architecture was already out of fashion. It was way too brutalist, way too modernist. And uh, then the first Intifada happened. Intifada is the Palestinian uprising. It was still being used. It's seven floors. So there are four floors uh, above the ground and three floors uh, underneath. On the top floor, which is open area, uh, many roads meet and the buses from all over the young Israeli state, already then a bit older, uh, meet here. And this is the reason why Filipinos and Filipinas, uh, let's say Filipinos for all of them, uh, but they are mostly like 85% female, of course, uh, they choose here for two reasons. First of all, in the second intifada, there was a big bombing right outside of the Tahana Merkezi uh, bus station. And that's when the suicide bombers uh, attacked the buses. So uh, the Israeli society invented the minibuses, which is called the Sherut, which is only for eight people. And you can easily spot a very nervous suicide bomber in this Sherut. So the Sherut started to be uh, embarking, uh, the passengers of Sherut started to embark outside of this massive building. And this massive building, which had several cinemas, culture, synagogues, shops, it was like a shopping mall, basically was empty, so you see all these shops completely deserted. No Israeli wanted to go inside there because they were fearing of further bombs because it was also like a huge space that it was easily uh, a target, it could be easily a target. So gradually, the Filipinos started to be more and more employed. Also, because of the Second Intifada, because before the Second Intifada, the job of taking care of elderly people was made by Christian and Muslim Palestinians who lived in what we call the occupied territories. They were not divided by a wall then, or no fence, nothing, and there were few settlements. So they could easily come for a day job and leave in the evening. But then people were uh, not allowed and also nervous to employ a Muslim or a Christian local, which is Palestinian. So uh, they invited the Filipinos. So the first Filipinos go to Israel around the 90s. So that older woman uh, there, she was one of the first to go there. And then they uh, chose this empty bus station because after six days of working at home, confined to those kind of interior spaces, they had their Saturday evening until Sunday evening free, according to contract, if they're lucky. Some of them are like, deny this permission. What they do is that they get on the bus, wherever they are in Israel. It's a small country, so it takes maximum two hours. So by, sun, uh, by Saturday evening, they come to the top floor of Tahana Merkezit, and all they have to do is just go downstairs and spend 24 hours inside this building. Because they don't want to go outside. If they go outside, they're subject to a lot of uh, in, in discrimination, as I said, racially, gender, and uh, I can say this now, most of these girls were illegal at the time. So you're watching footage which is not included in the film. Uh, I'll tell you also later how they pray. They don't go to the normal church, they create chapels. So if they stay inside the big compound, the bus station, it's unlawful. The police doesn't even go there. And according to a city, go a city myth, uh, the underground tunnels are occupied by bats. Because no bus is passing through those underground tunnels anymore. Because it was made as a depot, maintenance. So now the, uh, the National Authority for Wildlife P Preservation is, uh, I think, uh, protecting those bats inside the station, but they're not giving the same protection for the OFW workers. Uh, there are several raids, I have witnessed myself, suddenly the doors open and uh, Shin Beit, uh, it's not Mossad inside, it's Shin Beit, uh, the secret service comes in 
and they just pick up people and then uh, baby call. And usually uh, mothers with babies. So this was really, really tough times at the time. So what we always did was every Saturday evening we would meet here in the Tahana. You're seeing uh, Jill, uh, who's one of the few male uh, members of the community. And uh, as usual, uh, all the LGBT males are always pushed to the choreography job, and so he had to take <laughs> this job. And he's very happy. So what he's doing is he's rehearsing uh, a music video awards performance by Beyonce, all single ladies. <laughs> So this is also a physical exercise for the ladies who stay at home for six weeks, six days. So they do a lot of uh, facility, a lot of associations, associations for Mindanaos, associations for people from Visayas, Ilocanians, and uh, please correct me if I'm saying wrong, but like regional associations. And then there are uh, the more religious, but they are all generally very religious, but the ones that are really devout to the Catholic Church, they would never compete in the beauty pageants. Uh, they have their association. So on Saturday nights, first they put tables uh, inside the Tahana. Now I can show you. Maybe put it less close. Okay. Not too far. <laughs> okay, so these are, now it's empty. It's a Saturday. Uh, like the, the Saturday evening because it's religious really Shabbats. Like you don't really do much, so you don't travel. So this is the first hours. So all these tables are going to be filled with people and stuff, selling things. And actually one on here, I think on the upstairs, third floor, is called Avenida Avenue. And, uh, Avenida Avenue, yeah. And, uh, and then I think uh, Nepalese just entered and in Kathmandu there's a street. I forgot the name. When I was there, the Nepalese was arriving. They're cheaper labor than Filipinos. Filipinos are higher labor, uh, like uh, money-wise. Uh, and I think that was named after a street in Kathmandu. So you hardly see any Israeli people. And uh, when I invited my Israeli friends to come to the beauty pageant, which you see in the film, I saw them really agitated and nervous because it's a society defined by fear a lot and uh, they had a really hard time uh, staying more than half an hour inside because it's quite wild also, as you see. <laughs> okay, now I'll show another interior that they create, uh, which is the church. So the real Christians of what we call now Israel are, have been kicked out. They're the Palestinians and uh, there are many, many churches uh, <coughs> and their new community is the guest workers and uh, Filipinos of course are number one in that. But most of those big churches are in the Palestinian Area because Tel Aviv is a new city. It was Jaffa before. <laughs> Tel Aviv means sand dunes, so you were actually not supposed to build on those dunes, but they did, and they have never experienced a big earthquake since that time of the building of Tel Aviv. So there is a <laughs> big danger ahead. Uh, so the hilly side is where the Muslims and Christians were living. Uh, traditionally, the Jewish community in the Ottoman Empire was living in Jerusalem. They were not living in Tel Aviv. So those churches are in the Palestinian areas and because of this reason, there's a lot of civil service and police going around those neighborhoods. So the Filipinas, who are afraid of being caught without papers, are not able to go to these uh, churches. So what they do is they create chapels inside abandoned buildings uh, around the bus station. They don't really leave the area around the bus station. <laughs> so this is the Divine Mercy Chapel. Uh, this icon is uh, Divine Mercy icon, which is very popular within the Catholic community here. 
and uh, their priests are also coming from the Philippines. Uh, actually, interestingly, in one church, the priest was Lebanese, uh, but he was untouchable, kind of like he had like immunity. Uh, so uh, after uh, the the poster, the second thing I did was uh, to go to the church. So I went to the big church, not this one. And uh, I've been to churches before, uh, of course, because I come from Istanbul. It's the start of Christianity, so we are very used to churches. But I'm not very uh, like I don't have practice with the um, Catholic ritual. Uh, but I went in, and this I'm now going into the uh, topic uh, context responsive and how I work with people. I just went in, actually I was going from the beach, I had food probes in my <laughs> short tank though. And uh, I said, okay, let me go inside. And immediately I, I saw the smiling faces and uh, it's also part of the church practice that you always have to welcome people, right? Like maybe he will be converted. <laughs> so at that point people were like, as you know, at, at the end of the mass, like at one part of the mass, like they stand up and hold their hands and I was just in the middle, so I started holding people's hands. And, and then I joined the, the line, I had some money, so I gave to the church, and oh. I got more points uh, immediately, and then I started talking to some people, I said, like, I heard about the beauty pageant, and I also saw that they were collecting money in the, in the courtyard, in the church, and, uh, and then the Filipino community immediately embraced me, she, and some of the girls said, oh, we're also working for the beauty pageant with James, so please come, you know, uh, he must have told you, so please come with us. And then um, I was hungry, I was going to go home, but then they said, would you like to eat with us? Because we always have this habit, like custom, to we cook ourselves. And then to, uh, we went to one of the rooms in the church, and, uh, and I've done that a million times with all the Filipino communities I've been. Uh, I usually try to go to the church on a Sunday because that's their only off day that we can talk. And then we always uh, eat uh, pancit mostly, or similar uh, food, uh, rice cakes, uh, and white bread, of course, that's the most popular thing, <laughs> the white toast bread. Um, so, um, I work like this. I didn't know why I was working like this, but now I kind of know. Uh, I think I want to know people, and I'm using art as a tool. I'm lucky enough to survive as an artist in a world which is actually not so easy for artists to survive. Like, I can make my like primary joke as an artist, but I didn't start it like this. I didn't start saying that I will be an artist. As I said, I was coming from theater background. I wasn't expecting this. Uh, I worked with an American theater director who introduced me to video art because he's. Basically, he just said, like, oh, there's something called Chelsea, so I'll go there, you'll see something. So that's how he endorsed me. <laughs> uh, he's a very important theater uh, director, Robert Wilson, but he was very calm and cool about it. He didn't think I was going to go that way, so I went that way and I left his company at that time. Anyway, so I didn't start with thinking that I would be a professional artist. I was really curious. All my projects have been about uh, rituals and this is what links me to theater, my theater up upbringing. I was very dissatisfied about theater, the theater that we know, you know, the Shakespeare's and Chekhov's. And I was only interested in ancient Greek theater and I said to my teacher, which was a big shot star in Turkey, uh, in one of the big meetings I said, I don't, I'm not interested in anything between Euripides, which is the last in the line of the ancient Greek uh, playwrights, and my favorite, and Samuel Beckett. So in between there's a huge history gap. And of course, anything that falls in that huge history gap is what they love, Shakespeare, Chekhov, Ibsen, uh, all these people. So when I said that, there was like a massive, like terrible backlash to me. They made me fail, but it was a very liberal school. I didn't accept the fail. Uh, so I was very displeased with this textual, text-based um, uh, practice, whereas I didn't know why I was so interested in ancient Greek theater. And then I found out it wasn't art, it was religion. It was a religious practice turned into an aesthetically beautiful formation. 
And then I started thinking, uh, reading about mythology and looked at folklore. And uh, what you see here is also a ritual in a church. And actually, beauty pageants is another ritual. So all of these are rituals. And I started thinking that this is the form of performance that I'm interested in. Some people uh, use this as an art form, shaping it <coughs> into the uh, work of the playwright, using it in, in conjunction with an actor. But in the rituals, there is no playwright, there is no actor. The names don't matter, it's a community event. So I started then thinking, like, why am I so interested in community? I had a good family life, I didn't go through breakups with my family or something, but I was, as I said there, I was living abroad from home. And I'm very easy going with traveling, yes, but I felt inside that I was actually uh, in the diaspora myself. So no wonder I was interested in the rituals of people abroad, and these rituals are appropriations of their rituals at home. So then I started reading about why it's so important, why it's crazy important for Filipinos, this beauty pageant. Then I read about the American influence, then I read about the modern woman, and then I thought about like the, in, in Turkey after the Ottoman Empire, the modern woman has to be kind of like, has this etiquette and has to wear like swimsuit and evening gown and has to answer questions properly. That's where the Q&A comes. So then I started reading only then about anthropology. Uh, at this point, I think you should ask a question. <laughs> because we thought it should be a conversation. <laughs> the materials that you're showing us, they're also coming from different uh, moments. There's, it's not one specific year. And you no. also were mentioning that there's a bit of fundraising when it comes also uh, to create this context. Maybe it's important also to show that. Yes. Uh, and I, I, I'm now surprised uh, just seeing this. And I think for any artist or filmmaker, it's quite refreshing. And uh, it really shows you how making a work, which ended up on what you just saw at the other gallery, requires, in some cases, I guess some other people do it in another way, but there's so much hours of footage, yet it then became something very specific, no? Yeah. But, you know, it really feels that you needed to like be there, be with the camera, and there's something that we suggest that in the description of the work that I think with time, the perspective of Culkin's moving image has uh, become different with time in, in relation to how uh, when he filmed this, there was no real massive use of smartphones or social media. So the power of having a handy camera, I don't know if it's a mini TV or high H. Yeah, small, yeah. small. The, the use of that technology to produce a moving image was um, an important act of power, I think the power of representation. And and in this case of representing something that in most, in, in this context that you're given mm. of Israel and Palestine and the Middle East in general, uh, it's quite an invisible narrative. You know? It's not, uh, uh, it's, in the, it's in the shadows because there is more macro politics that are taking uh, discourse of identity uh, to a, let's say, more visible than uh, but maybe show us, yeah, the video, the footage as well of the fundraising, or if you want to... Yeah, I, right. yeah. I'll, I'll first come from the other question. Uh, in all my works, uh, including this, uh, I only use maybe 5% of everything I shot. Uh, again, I come back to why I'm doing this, because I want to record as soon as possible. First, to see myself, and also with the option to show this community to the outside. So that's why they called me the messenger many times. Uh, the journalist came into the, the messenger, and that was like a religious connotation as well, we talked about it. Uh, and 
I use the camera, as Inti said, a very small camera. Still now I use always small cameras because I don't want to interfere with the private sphere of the people I'm shooting. First of all, I always take permission. There is never ever any case that I am filming without permission. Uh, so that's an ethic I always follow. And uh, secondly, I should be comfortable enough to uh, look around the environment with one eye and then keep the other eye closed with the lens. But I usually shoot with the open eye. I go, basically what I do is that just like here, in this example, it's a good example, I'm actually starting to shoot in the car. There's no reason we are going with a taxi to the Filipino Independence, Independence Day celebration in Tel Aviv. Um, then I just entered the, they entered before me and I just enter and I immediately like go towards them. So I film everything. I have no scenario, nothing. I just film everything I want to remember, basically, for myself. And uh, now about this most important uh, aspect of these diasporic rituals. Uh, there is something called the gift economy, which is considered more and more by uh, a lot of scholars, thinkers, philosophers, uh, especially from the Second World War onwards, as an alternative possibility to capitalist economies. So in the gift economy, you constantly continue giving gifts and receiving gifts. And that is the economy that you're generating. In the capitalist economy, you're buying or you're doing barters. Barter is when, you, when I give something to Inti, Inti gives me his beer. When I give Inti a banana, Inti gives me his beer. So it's still very capitalist. Like we have a profit from this. Like I, I and I like it because he gives me beer and he likes me because I give him banana. <laughs> <laughs> in the gift economy <laughs> in the gift economy, this is a different <laughs> circle. And it is a circle. And here is a is a line. But in the gift economy it's a circle. The gift economy comes from the concept of potlatch in North American uh, Indians. And uh, in this, uh, potlatch is the name of the feast. So one clan, let's say Jam has a clan, I have a clan. And then today it's my time to uh, show myself. And like this, this clan and your clan, let's say Jam is the leader and I'm the leader of this clan. And uh, me and Inti and my clan, we work for the whole year for this feast. We produce. Because in this feast, we're going to destroy them in front of your eyes. We first give you a huge feast, more than you need. You will eat everything we serve. And then you will eat and you will eat. At one point, you won't be able to eat. Then we, in front of your eyes, we destroy that. And we also destroy houses, tents. We destroy these books. We destroy it. So there is nothing to hold onto. The word to have has no meaning, but the word to give has more meaning. The word to save has no meaning in the potlatch and the gift economy, because people don't save. They work in order to produce something to give away to the other one. And then the third clan comes, and the third clan makes another feast, because he, they ate our food here, and let's say Jam's clan ate, your clan is supposed to do a bigger one. And this agonistic way of showing more power is actually not only the ego, but also uh, sustaining the economy. And at that time, there is no word economy. Sustaining the um, livability of the community because nobody is left hungry in this sense. Because you don't have to buy. So this is, in the, after the Second World War, by usually Marxist uh, thinkers was considered a dream. But then they were criticizing this. Like, it's not that perfect, this potlatch, because uh, some potlatches were uh, uh, becoming problematic for the communities. They couldn't produce any more of those gifts. But what's important is the circle. So you give her something, and then the, the soul of what you gave to her is hurting her and she has to give it to the person next to her. So you don't hold the gift. 
you have to give it to somebody else. And then this is also in the, uh, in the Pacific uh, areas here in Papua and uh, in the east of the Philippines, this has been practiced also. Uh, and uh, one of the curators working in Singapore, Uta Metamar, is doing this kula ring. I don't know if you know this project that they're going around, but with very expensive yards to discuss gift economy. I, I don't think that's the right way to approach. <laughs> With Francesca von Habsburg on, the, on board and founding it. So that's a different thing. But the essence of giving... We're live on Facebook. <laughs> that's fine. No. No, no, no that's, that's completely fine. We, are, we have to talk about these things. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I crudely described this to you. It's, it's bigger, it's very deeper. But the gift... The word economy comes later. The gift giving is uh, a circular giving, and you see this in wedding ceremonies as well. You go, you come to my wedding, and you attach uh, something to the groom or the wife, and then when we come to your wedding, we have to attach more money to you. This covers the expense of the event. Also now, let's say like Bellas Artists is hosting an event, they will put 10 beers on the table. When I host an event and when Bellas Artists is gonna come, I will put 12 on the table. And uh, now let's come to the rituals in the diaspora. Now, this group are dressed with their costumes for the evening that is coming ahead of them. And they are representing Bini Bini Pilipinas Israel. It will happen, I think, three, four days after this, uh, Independence Day. So they are coming here to promote their event, to attract people, uh, inviting them to come to the bus station. That's the DJ on the right. I think he had an affair with one of the girls. Uh, that's James. That's... James. This is James. Yeah, this is James Charlene, who I talked on the phone. She is now living in Canada, in the green pasture. She, she made it. She's in, she's in Canada. She's super happy. And I think, I think she transformed. Like, I think she did that. Uh, so, again, we're seeing a, a ritual, the Independence Day, which is not, not a religious, but a secular uh, ritual. But, it, again, it's happening uh, on, a, on, a, on a Sunday and uh, the people are getting united, they're bonding with each other, and they need these doses all the time, to repeat these doses. She's the girl who's in the interview uh, in the little uh, monitor. And when the day comes, when we go, as other Filipinas, to this event, which is happening inside the bus station, we pay money to get in. And this is for the raffle draw. It was in US dollars, I think five dollars or something. Everyone gets a number. But what, what is this place? Is this is a stadium that they hired for the Filipino uh, <coughs> uh, Independence Day. Uh, the other is in the bus station. Uh, so we pay money to enter and we get like, for example, like 300 guests, right? So there are tickets from 100 to 300 and some of the money that is collected in this is paying the expenses of these costumes, of this organization, like we hi they hired a little minibus to come here. This costume costed a lot. Uh, <laughs> she's in Hong Kong now, uh, Evelyn. I'm, all, I'm in touch with all of them. Uh, and, uh, but the, the excess money, and this is important in the gift economy, there is constantly an excess. You never save that excess, you never keep it. Now, in the, in, the, in the economy that we know, we save for our children, we save, we pay for insurance, we save, we save. We are, some, we are a person because we have good savings. In the gift of economy, it's the different. That who spends more for the community is the real man or the woman. Like, the power is shown with this. So, uh, the excess money that is uh, collected from this uh, ticket uh, sales is going as gifts in this raffle draw. The raffle draw is like in between, that's why the beauty pageant takes six hours. What I showed. It's only you're seeing in 45 minutes, but it's six hours. We were really exhausted at the end because constantly gifts. They make a raffle draw, they uh, choose one person and the gift is a skin cream. They give uh, a spa treatment. 
the biggest uh, gift is the ticket. They call it the ticket. It's the ticket to go back to Manila. <coughs> because some employers, they don't give this right to you. So they have difficulties. And then, if there is like a, a natural disaster in the Philippines, they make a beauty pageant just for that. To save money, to make, uh, to bring, uh, like to gather money. To, to bring and then when I talk with them they feel psychologically good and also this is part of the culture that is actually embedded in many cultures even though you're living in the most capitalist country well, what is it like Western Europe Northern Europe or <laughs> North America right but it's still embedded in people's culture to give uh, like in Islam in, in this month Ramadan you are supposed to give like you are supposed to give I think 25% of your wealth it's written in the in the book uh, so this is also a gift. So uh, you should not be saving uh, it because it's dirty. If you save it, it's dirty. It's the soul that it will contaminate you and it will be bad for your household if you save this. Um, <coughs> Can I? Maybe sure. I, well, of course. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. 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 Now that you explain this uh, politics of gifting and more of a discussion on economy. I, I was just thinking now that while making the exhibition um, the archetype of what we propose as a foundational moment of this beauty pageant culture and practice coming from the Queens of Carnival during the American colonial period when we were like updating the archive uh, the context. <laughs> <Here. laughs> uh, it was quite clear that the beauty pageants of the Queens of Carnival were happening in the context of the Manila Carnival, which was this um, festivity that was recreational, but mostly it was the context that introduced habits of its consumerism. Because as you see through the uh, uh, memory of that event, not only were cities or regions or provinces represented by a woman, by a Miss Husson or Miss Visayas, or specifically uh, uh, provinces of Patangas, etc. But each of these places had its own pavilion. Uh, where they could sell their goods. So it was more, it, it was actually not the gift coach, but it was the installation of the like real capitalist consumerism. But it didn't work. Yeah, it didn't work. Yeah. The Filipinos changed it. <laughs> they deformed it. The Americans came with a very capitalist approach of this. Um, uh, I'm sure there was a lot of sales going around in the carnival. It's a world fair, like a world fair. So there is a profit to be made. They're planning for a profit. But the Filipinos destroy that in the diaspora. They just give it away. They constantly give it away. They don't hold. And uh, this is the, the, the beauty of uh, these rituals. And why are they making... In the capitalist way, you will not make a beauty pageant every month. In Tel Aviv, there is a beauty pageant every month. There's a beauty pageant for Filipinos who are married, who are not married, who are maybe married. There is a, there is a beauty pageant. There is a beauty pageant for men. Uh, there is a beauty pageant. I'll show you this. This is beautiful. Um, uh, what was it? Here, 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 James. Uh, they find an excuse to make a beauty pageant. Like spring beauty pageant, autumn beauty pageant. They're using this, but in the capitalist way, it would be only one label, right? Miss Universe is not repeated. There's Miss Universe Ilocano, Miss Universe Philippine chapter, uh, Israel chapter, Bini Bini Filipinas. It's just morphed into, it loses its context. It loses its um, um, capitalist context. Because in the other one, there's a label, and I think they buy the rights for that, Miss Universe or Miss Bini Bini Filipinas. Uh, the franchise. I'm pretty sure some people will be angry from Bini Bini Filipinas uh, that there is another in Israel. Uh, yeah, yeah, they can they can sue they can sue James, you know. So um, 
Okay, this, oh yeah, I opened the right, okay, I'll show you uh, outtakes from an interview that I did with James, that we should watch this. Sorry, but you said you didn't need your shop in the Philippines. Yes, what? in the Yes, in the Max. I'm gonna show you first the house, if I can. This is the employer. That's right, he would. He has Alzheimer's, so he doesn't know what's going on. And I felt really uneasy. I said, like, James, somebody is watching us. Can we ask for permission? He said, it's okay, he doesn't remember. So this is where James works. Look at the computers at the time, look at the setup. But I didn't include this in the film, I'm just showing to put in the context. Now, this is the beauty pageant which I want to talk about. James, who is a very active member, and she's like a hero in the Filipino community in Israel, one day wanted to make Miss Gay Asia. And uh, she wanted Asian countries to be represented in Israel. Each country have a gay contestant. Here, gay means transvestite. Like, not the macho gays. The transvestite gays. <laughs> so, you see this is Miss Vietnam, Miss Philippines, Miss Mongolia, Miss India. So this happened in Israel. This, is ha this happened in Israel in 2007. These are the national costumes. But none of these people are from those countries. They're all Filipinos. <laughs> all of them. There is no Indian. All the awards. So did they do it? Look at the Korean, please. <laughs> I, I, I want the best national costume, best in Capital Girls, Miss Stalin, Miss Poker Germany. She won all the prizes. I'm going to see the American movie, I want to show you the movie. And then she, she told me, and she told me, I said, like, well, how could you do it? But, like, nobody understood it. It doesn't matter. It meant, like, uh, the intention is important. Like, we are making a, a, a pageant. Yeah. First of all, like, um, their time is so important that one day has to be used in the best way. And they're celebrating their own culture. And the whole culture of the Filipino LGBT transsect, the transvestite, is to dress up as much as possible. And, uh, and they feel very at ease in the, the bus station. So there is no logic. You see, like, it's completely defying the franchise of Miss Gay Asia, if there is one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have any questions? We should open a little bit to the floor. Anything you're curious? Anything else you want to see? I might have shot it. <laughs> is that projector OK? Oh, yeah. It looks like it's gonna fall. Oh. So There's some smoke. I know it's you. The it's smoke. Have you uh, spoken had any um, feminist backlash with the beauty <coughs> pageant? You know, like there's, for example, now a lot of people are talking about like the. <coughs> representation of women in beauty pageants and um, how this is object the you know the objectification of women. Just a question, and like, has that ever been kind of uh, uh, a reaction when showing the work um, in different exhibitions? Uh, no, not really. Yeah. When they show, when they see the work, uh, a lot of feminist theorists theoreticians have been very enthusiastic about showing this work 
as well. One of them is Irit Rogov. She wrote a big article about it. Uh, when you hear about it, they seem a bit skeptical. But when they see it, especially in the yeah. Q&A part, they understand, they understand it. it. The uh, but uh, a, another question that comes often is, usually comes in the, um, I know the discussions within the Filipino community. For example, in Germany, they don't do so many beauty pageants yeah. because in Germany, there is a different, or, or, they are not OFWs, they are married. And there's also this marriage, you know, marrying a German guy and going to Germany and they go through a different life. <laughs> they go through different life um, patterns and they are critical there to beauty pageants. But even they are critical, whatever activity they do, they always insert one little beauty pageant production number. Another uh, interesting um, uh, reaction, which will link me to discussions we had in Las Casas over uh, misery porn and poverty porn. Uh, in Berlin, uh, I was talking to a big <coughs> conference uh, in the house that I to there about, and there were uh, a lot of master PhD students, uh, mostly white European, and after they showed, uh, they saw the film, one of the girls stood up very angry. She said, but you're only showing them having fun. She found it problematic. She said, these people are suffering and you're not showing that part of their life. And she was very angry. And I said, but I'm actually angry at you saying this. Why do we have to portray the immigrant always in misery? And uh, that's why I did the interviews. Because they talk about their hardships. I mean, you see the conditions they work in. It's not easy to attend that man or that woman in the video. They have to have fun. We, like, we all have to have fun. Uh, and uh, this gives us a, a battery, uh, like a charge, recharge. So one of the chapters in my PhD is called Voluntary Isolation. Uh, because I talk with the people who do these rituals. They actually don't want so many locals to come. But they want to feel comfortable. Like the Turkish uh, people in uh, in Germany doing their weddings, they might Germans if they're like employers are German, but they actually don't want them to come. They really want to like it's like a girls' night, right? It's like a girls' night. <laughs> you don't want uh, you want to like really like seclude yourself a little bit just for like three four hours, and you really like discharge all your problems and have fun because at the end of the day you will go to that misery that woman was asking for. And, and this uh, brings me to the subject of documentary. In documentary, uh, we are kind of expected to see the most controversial, the most uh, painful, the one that we don't live through, so that when we see other people's misery, we will feel comfortable because we don't have that misery. And then we will leave our seats in the cinema or at the film festival or online comfortable, you know, we're going to say, because it's, it's like very, again, capitalist. If you show to a Filipino audience, uh, a Manila audience, how bad Jakarta is, they will like the film. Because <laughs> they will think that Manila is not that bad at all. <laughs> that the Manila traffic is really not bad. You know, but... Uh, <coughs> But we can't, in the arts, I think we have to do, like some of us have to do the opposite. We have to be critical and we have to be, and this is more critical than showing the Filipino community in misery. Mm -hmm. I could have shown that, but I think in the film you, sh you see it because when they answer the questions to the jury, there is this tension yeah. in them. Like they say, the jury who is Israeli mostly, and they, they do this deliberately because they want to show themselves to the host society, they want to stage it, asks the question, if you win this contest, that's a stupid question, what will you say about Israeli society to your friends in the Philippines? And the girl asks, uh, answers the question, and I know her. I know how she went, what she went through. But she said, I will tell them that the Israelis are very good people. They're giving us the opportunity to work here. She's back in the Philippines now. But at that time, you know, uh, 
it's like a it's like a tool for them to show the Israeli society <coughs> that they are happy to be employed by them there. Uh, so in this work, you also see that uh, whatever people call the misery or the trouble. So, but I prefer to show it in a more complex way. Whereas in the documentary film world, if you know this TV channel called Arte, which is a French TV channel, mm -hmm. uh, which is the popular channel of all intellectual Europeans. <laughs> I can't watch it. I, 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 I cannot watch it. You know, I really have trouble like watching those uh, documentaries uh, because they really follow an agenda of patronizing from uh, with a Western gaze. And uh, <coughs> now the, the, the fashion is I can open the subject, my new project is about China's expansion. There's something called China bashing. China bashing is a common thing in the Western world. In the academy, where I am in Berlin University, any Chinese student who makes a group, uh, presentation comes up with questions of, but China is not free, you are supporting the party. They try not to see the complexities you can be an individual, okay, you don't have the right to vote or change the constitution or even the party, but people are not seeing other people as an individual in a big society. So what I try to do with my projects is always like follow them all over and over and over and over again and have a gaze so I can see the personal moment myself first, from myself, and also show it to the people because it's the individuals who make the mass. But we're it's much easier for us to judge. Like we were, uh, RJ and Ruby, we were coming from the casino yesterday, <laughs> and then the Grab driver picked us up from the VIP exit, and then, of course, uh, there were a lot of Chinese people. And then we talked about the Chinese population here, and he was very nice. He said, like, you know, I'm having difficulty with some of the Chinese, the Chinese customers I have, but I cannot generalize. Them. I cannot say that all of them are rude, but the ones that specifically come into my car have been rude. <laughs> <laughs> it was like so, so fantastic. It was like a good end to the day. Uh, <coughs> but in many art uh, projects or in many documentaries, we don't have the sensitivity. We are uh, labeling uh, countries. We're labeling like, uh, even biennials are made for that. Even uh, the... the uh, the, the concept of exhibitions are made, like uh, an artist, uh, an exhibition, I know this because I'm Turkish and Turkey is like the disgust member of the European Union, is Turkey Europe, are you enough European or whatever. <laughs> so there are a lot of exhibitions in Europe which only have Turkish artists. Only have Turkish artists. And then it's like a zoo then. Like you put people in a zoo and then, as I said, it's going to be like in Brazil now. Any Brazilian individual in the world is going to have uh, faced this question: How is it in your country? How is Bolsonaro? You know, like, and, and a Filipino individual here is probably facing the same, like being responsible for anything that Duterte does. You know, but uh, with these kind of projects, which is slow burn projects, like slow food, you know, it's really cooking very slow, very slow. And uh, one day, one important curator who I don't want to name told me one day at the start of my career he said Kukan you'll never make money I said why because you work with Tosto I said like, <laughs> this is this is the like I really don't think you should say this because this is exactly what I you should be supporting when I should he's a really really cool intellectual very enlightened curator but um, it's like it's really uh, we're not producers we are creating something we're not producing something we're creating an environment, an understanding. So I think if we, uh, even the same for art institutions, why should an art institution always make exhibitions? They should just close for a while and do nothing and just think about it. I don't know, like we're constantly putting products uh, onto, the, onto the scene. And, uh, and then these products are made for our own ego or for our career. But what I see in this community is they're making products as well but it's really touching a lot of more other people in the community. So that's why I want to learn from them and to use this in my own world. So I'm always a foreigner for, uh, for these communities, but uh, 
I try to be kind of like an insider as much as possible. But I know that I always have the camera. I'm different. I can never be objective. I choose what to show you. I choose how to edit it. But there is a there is a layer of being a guest, and there's another layer of being a, a welcome guest. Maybe, maybe we can close at this. <laughs> maybe because Point. you started something that um, kind of like created another life of yours directly, being involved with different Filipino communities, not only in Israel, but after having developed this work, suddenly, as you said, you were known as the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, when you were in Hong Kong, um, showing part, a fraction of uh, the work that is now installed here, the Filipino community contacted you through the network of friends and they No, I said hi, you. I came to Hong Kong <laughs> I said hi <coughs> to some of the contestants I arrived in Hong Kong They said, very well, welcome, you will be a judge tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? Like, <coughs> they, um, they just got me But it wasn't my first judge uh, uh, work I've been a judge in Paris, I've been a judge in uh, was I in <coughs> Germany? In Istanbul. In Istanbul, I've been an MC. I was presenting it. I was, uh, I can show maybe uh, uh, some footage from this beauty pageant uh, in Istanbul. So, uh, there I am. Like, <laughs> this is my second costume change. I did the pineapple. Uh, What's the pineapple fi fiber? Pinya. Pinya, in the beginning, I think. I was so embarrassed. And all my friends were there, my mom was there. <laughs> and, uh, but... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Is this <all>? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they always start with the national anthem. So a lot of like rich collectors came because I was on stage, and then they entered the room, and then they had to stand up for the Filipino national anthem, and then the Turkish national anthem. And all these like collectors who hardly go to these kind of events, they were like, they didn't know what to do. They said, what are we seeing here? And they were so in love with what they saw. <coughs> This is the Turkish National March. I think I come after this. Uh, if it's easy, I'll show it. I would like to introduce to you our host for tonight. First, we have our very first Kabapaya and a former Vietnam officer, Dabi Musha Secretary of Vietnam. She was our Vietnam Secretary, Miss. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> I, I'm too shy to write. <laughs> Who was filming there? Your mom was filming. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on.
Shall we watch a few of the Dashiell costumes? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so how many or Dutch? I think. Oh, this is the ambassador. Uh, I think five or six I've been either judge or and also my assistants were judge, my professors were jury, uh, <laughs> MC. I, they also do a lot of talks so I'm gonna skip these talks to show you the productions. They spent a lot of money in this and also as I said like in Turkey they're really like uh, very well paid and their resources are much better than in Israel. In Israel, the budgets are... <laughs> I like... I look like a priest, the boys next to the priests. You know, like... Wow. They, uh, they always say uh, their name, where they come from in the Philippines, and where they live in Istanbul, which neighborhood they live. It, it was the same in Israel also, they say like where they live in uh, Israel. But in Istanbul, I think they're producing it, uh, most of the stuff themselves. And other, again, the organizer is a gay uh, male person, a two, two gay male persons, one transsexual, uh, transvestite, let's say, and one. Uh, and me, I'm also an MC, it's also local MC is gay. And it's so funny because the, the neighborhoods where they live are uh, actually shanty towns. And they like the Turkish audience knows like where, where does she live? <laughs> like because like 
they they are a night. Uh, most of them are uh, live out, not live in. Uh, live out in Turkey, they prefer to live out. So they live in like really outskirts of the of the town, but they have these beautiful costumes and they say representing Gültepe, <laughs> which is like a uh, very like poor uh, neighbor. Uh, yeah, far away. <coughs> Boss. <laughs> but we can ask. I have one last question. If anybody who was shy before <laughs> asked a question, now that we're heated and any of the escuela participants, there's some escuela participants of tomorrow. <laughs> Should we force them to ask yeah. questions? <laughs> yeah. If they want. Hello. Hi. Oh. Oh. Hi, <laughs> I think that's the, that's a sign to end. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Maybe before we applaud you, one just to wrap up and oh, say okay. that um, you mentioned yeah that uh, the con <laughs> we've invited you to speak under the topic of context responsive art practice, uh, which uh, it's a little bit our own experimental topic. In our educational program of uh, Escuela. And by context responsive, uh, the artists that we've invited are addressing this in a very uh, different ways, uh, more broadly, but I'm very happy that uh, Coggins' work is definitely a practice that looks at specific context, but uh, not only one context, but speaks of what was happening in Israel, what is happening in the Philippines, historically, individually. So it's not, the context responsive becomes, starts from something specific, but suddenly navigated. Well, through the talk, it took us through so many different uh, geographies and places. And uh, thank you very much for sharing your work. And we're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Oh, question, yes. Not that question. Microphone. I just want to know um, when you find, uh, when you're wearing or content, you find this uh, poster and uh, uh, you start working with Filipino people and all of your experience, it was from your place or from other countries. But now uh, you are coming here, so uh, all of this experience that you have with people there, how did you uh, uh, confront it when you arrived here? Uh, when people talk to you, to you uh, about the, the how people are here or experience, uh, how do you confront that in this experience in this moment, in this moment that you spent here? Well, ironically, all the subjects that I make even when they're shown in their home, they get similar reactions like in a foreign country. For example, if I do a work about a Turkish religious minority, which we didn't have time to show, I showed it in Switzerland, people ask very curious questions about how, why do we, didn't we know about these details about these people? I mean, we live in the same country, but we don't know these details. We learned a lot. And then I show the work in Turkey, same questions come. So ironically, at the opening day, <coughs> I met a lot of people, and I watched a lot of people. That, that's my job, I also watch people. The reactions what they give to the magazine covers is very similar, the same similar curiosity that the same magazine covers were displayed when in Germany or in, in Paris. Because I think in, in the work you see an aspect of uh, a community which hasn't been really represented so much. Uh, the Balakpayans are known by the Balakpayan boxes. The Balakpayans are known by the Balakpayan, uh, the orthodox, by the lines and the uh, lavish spendings they have maybe when they come to the Philippines. Uh, but let's keep in mind that there were very few OFWs in the audience that day. So this is a different audience. And sometimes, even in the same country, they don't brush shoulders so much. So 
believe me, there are very similar um, reactions somehow. But what's so special about this is uh, the magazine covers are in English and in Tagalog. So here, the audience was really reading every line. And they knew the link of home. Like, um, a European audience doesn't know why Enrique Iglesias is on the cover of a Filipino magazine in history. <laughs> but we know here now. I mean, I, I also didn't know before I came here the first time, seven years ago. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that we sometimes don't see things in front of our nose. <laughs> and uh, in all my uh, projects, I was in the beginning nervous, like, how am I going to like show this in that country or in my country or but for some reason I'm choosing subjects that are really hidden from the general eye of the of the people or I'm showing a part of the, the society which hasn't really been represented or portrayed. But of course like for me this is the highlight of my career to show this piece in the Philippines. It's like super super important for me yeah. The other day there was an article somewhere and they fantastically, without even needing to ask, they uh, put the YouTube video in the article, they embedded it. I think this is, this is fantastic, this is what I want, because I want the art to go out of the institution's walls as well. And uh, I was curious, I checked, there are more and more people watching work uh, online. Um, and uh, I think the work is not going to get old because it's continuing uh, social phenomenon. Could that help? Could that answer your question? <laughs> Oops. Uh. May I just add that even though we've spoken in such a context of the OFWs in the Philippines, it's something that would be very local and diasporic. Yeah. Uh, the phenomenon of migrant work uh, it's, uh, has global uh, relationships and conditions and great part of the economy of globalization wouldn't be moving in such a way if this type of labor wouldn't exist. So like in Hong Kong, just to give one example, there wouldn't be a women lawyers, bankers yeah. working instead of taking care of, well, not that I'm forcing to take care of their things, but the reason why they have a certain feminism, you could call, of having some uh, mobility in the workforce, uh, it happens because there is a Filipino workforce that is taking care of their children. So we've talked about this in this context, <laughs> but this is part of a phenomenon that moves the global economy on a larger scale. So just to think about this, though, what's interesting, of, again, what you brought is that we touch on this subject, but through a very intimate navigational uh, representing yeah, its narratives. <laughs> okay, let's collect money from this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Give back to me. Yes. Yes. I would like the <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> four. Um, four. We can buy your phone. But then you have to buy us iPhone 6. Thank you. We have more. Ah, no, more, more questions. questions. You see, I told you it would be more. Hang on, hang on. Because I also did a film about beauty pageant in Hong Kong 
It's called Sunday with the Queen. No! Like, listen to yourself, or as, as the other girl said, like, the priest 
is also saying like, you know, maybe she's repeating what the priest is saying. <laughs> you, you can have a happy moment, but just watch that moment go past by. You, know, you will not always be happy. And also like to be happy with little. That's the most important thing. In Hong Kong, you know. I mean, in Hong Kong, when they invited me to the tier, I met a few people, some of them I knew, some of them I knew from, uh, from uh, Israel. Uh, they were passing around a, a bottle. I thought it was like water. You thought it was what? I, I thought it was like alcohol water or something that we were having fun. They were sharing both. What? Because yeah. life is so expensive and their salaries are so low. <coughs> they said, like, we even share water. And I also shared with folks like there was a circle of sharing. And uh, then I cannot complain about not having enough money to have a water. Or, <laughs> you know, like, this, this brings people together. And they have a really, maybe you don't want to be in their situation, but you see them and you learn from them. And then I'm sure they also learn from you. So this is the most important thing that uh, I learned from the overseas food people be resilient in times of hardship. They still go to That's a good phenomenon. I mean, also, I researched about Turkish and Kurdish immigrants who are living in Europe. Uh, they are not as high as 90%, but 65-70% are voting for uh, their leader because these people have been feeling ignored by their community at home. The OFWs are seen as uh, money. <coughs> they bring money, they bring income, and they're just. Uh, and the, the Turkish uh, guest workers were also seen bringing currency, different currency, to the country. And so the government, governments before, or leaders before, didn't really invest in their emotions. So what we're seeing in the world is that emotional politics. Trump is doing the same, Bolsonaro is doing the same, Erdogan is doing the same, the character is doing the same, emotional politics. Like they make them feel kind of powerful somehow. And for this reason, you cannot say anything bad about the actor to the most of the views. When he went to meet Netanyahu, like before the last election, uh, thousands of Filipinos going to meet him. Uh, but when you are there, in that context, you understand. We cannot judge them. Here, when we hear the news, we go like, oh, why are they doing this? But uh, we have to understand the context why they are feeling so empowered by somebody who actually just recently denounced God. But they still, I asked them, I said, like, hey, did you hear that? The time has just denounced God. It's okay, it's okay. They said, like, it's, we're not interested in that. Like, you can say that. <laughs> we know that God exists. We know that God exists, and we don't like support the character because of we have our own you know, religious belief, but we support the character for something else. And always the drug, the drug, and our children back home, where we want to be sure about our children to be having a safe environment to live in. <laughs> their husbands or ex-husbands are not taking care of them, so they are fearing that they are out on the street, and they see the character as as Jesus Christ. But we have to understand this is the reality that let's work from this. You know, we can't like label people who voted for Trump uh, as ignorant people. They have a reason why they voted because they felt ignored for the for the previous instructions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.